experimental farm. Oh, everybody has to accept the recording, I think. Do you, is there a flash of a message up there? Yeah. No. Yeah. No. If you don't want to be recorded, I suppose you could hang up right now, but that would be very sad. <laughs> Maybe we should put Andy in the middle of our three guests so that we split our insect guys up so that they don't feel <laughs> they need to just be like, I, I do what he does. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, good. So. Chris, do you mind starting us off? Sure, no problem. Um, I'm, I'm Chris Holmstrom. Uh, I was a, an undergrad at Rutgers. I started, um, this job immediately upon graduation in 1987. So that, that makes this my 34th year. And uh, I, I, I started working under Don Prostak, who was the pest management specialist at the time. And he had a fledgling integrated pest management program for sweet corn that he started in 1972 um, and managed to show sweet corn growers in New Jersey that there were a lot of low hanging fruit with regard to eliminating insecticide applications um, to manage corn earworm and European corn borer and, and fall armyworm. And he was, he was pretty successful at that. And um, so successful in fact that, that he built up a client base that was large enough to turn that program over to a private consultant, um, which crashed and burned over the next few years. And so by the time I came on board, um, he was ready to get started again. We had gotten money from the federal government to uh, initiate and improve integrated pest management research. And, and Dr. Prostak opted to, um, to turn that into an outreach program. And so what started as sweet corn now uh, includes not, not just sweet corn, but all the coal crops. Uh, Pumpkins and winter squash, tomatoes, peppers, and um, catchy. My, uh, my area is, if, if you drew a line from Trenton to the shore, uh, I handle everything north of that. And we do insect trapping, insect monitoring, um, feed on the ground. I hire three technicians to do, uh, that I train that do scouting with, for me. And we work with approximately 45 to 47 growers, I believe. Um, some organic, mostly not, but, but a few organic growers. And um, we do all those crops for the majority of them, uh, as well as um, churning information that they gather and Joe's technicians and Joe gather into the log, which is the plant and pest advisory every week, which includes insect population maps. So I, I do that. Um, I did go back to school in 99 and got my Masters um, in plant pathology under Andy's predecessor, Steve Johnston, um, because I recognized that diseases were at least half the problem, definitely more than half the problem. And so um, work worked very closely with Joe and Andy and uh, have enjoyed it for, for 30 plus years. Great. When you, you say that diseases are a big part of the problem, that um, insects, causing disease or spreading disease and in, in no just if you're if you're a vegetable producer in this in this area i suppose it's true for just about anywhere um you have insects weeds and diseases those are your three major problems um and insects are certainly a big problem but they are in my mind more manageable than the diseases are because there are certain diseases that can put you out of business right quick um, and it's not, it's not nearly that bad with insects. Um, I mean, insects are pretty fun to work with. I think Joe would, would agree. <laughs> uh, unpredictable sometimes, but, but they are, uh, you know, eating, moving things, and that makes them vulnerable in a lot of ways. Um, disease path, you know, path pathogens like some of the downy mildews and phytophthora and so forth are really, really difficult to manage. Um, and, and I think take up a lot more uh, effort and time on the growers part. How does, a, how does a grower begin working with you? Is there a process of application or something? No, it's, it's largely uh, word of mouth. I mean, I, people contact us 
um, ask if they can participate. I do the best I can to try and fit them in. We do have limitations in terms of, of manpower. Um, anybody that I can't work directly with in terms of actually providing them with a, a twice weekly uh, visit from the technician and, and me about every two weeks, I come out with the technicians. But um, if I can't do that for them, they all have my phone number. Um, we converse a lot. Uh, so I talk to a lot of growers that aren't in the active scouting program. Um, when, I, when, it's, when I'm able to, I, might, I will make visits to their farms just, just to consult. Um, you know, we don't charge for any of that. It's just, a, it's just a thing to do for people that I just don't have the manpower to get, to get boots on the ground there on a regular basis. Um, for those who do have uh, are active participants in the scouting program, we do, we do charge for that. Um, and that's, you know, it's a per acre fee based on the different crops. And that money all goes to the technicians who are mostly college students and pays their wages and their and compensates them for the use of their own vehicles. Um, some of that money, Joe and I also turn into uh, SNAP research projects. If we have an emergency that we need to deal with, we might, uh, you know, we might run a small trial at one of the research farms or on a grower farm. Um, but uh, that's, that's where the grower funds go and it's enabled us to, to have a little bit of flexibility over the years. Can you talk a little bit about the, the scouting? What, what is, what, what uh, you know, for somebody who's new to IPM, what, what is the significance of scouting and how do you go about it? Well, the important thing is to look at crops and, and perform your function the same way each time with a standardized scouting form so that you can track changes from, from visit to visit or week to week. So on a typical visit um, on, a, on a, a farm in Northern New Jersey, which would be a mixed vegetable operation, um, the technicians would be looking at selected plantings of field of sweet corn, sorry, not field corn, um, sweet corn based on growth stage because there might be differences in insect infestation. So they would be looking at some whorl stage, some pre-tassel stage. Um, as we get through the middle of the summer, we would start looking at seedling stage corn as well because we're concerned about fall armyworm, which could attack that, that very young stage. And they will present the grower with the findings um, in, in the form of uh, a written up scouting form, which, which provides the numbers, you know, numbers of plants infested, uh, thresholds that are associated with those infestation levels um, and recommendations from us, not, you know, not demands, but just recommendations. Um, and then they would also look at uh, one or two tomato plantings, depending upon how many are active at that time. And there we would be looking for the major insect pests, uh, the presence of beneficial insects. Uh, we're looking for certain diseases as well. And again, there's a scouting form associated with that so that the grower can review each week uh, and see how things are changing. Uh, some things like aphids, we, we prefer to watch that population uh, until or unless they become a problem um, by depositing their droppings on developing fruit. We wouldn't want that to happen. Um, but up to that point, we can tolerate some aphids. Certain things we have low tolerance for like spider mites, um, corn earworm, uh, infesting the fruit would be something we would have low tolerance for. Starting about a week ago, they are also including the pumpkins and winter squash as they begin to emerge because it's critically important that we look at those as they emerge. Um, most of the growers uh, who are not organic are purchasing seed that's, that's pre-treated for, for cucumber beetle, but even those growers will often have mixed gourds that uh, invariably there are some in there that are not treated. And so cucumber beetle is a problem because it can vector bacterial wilt to those. And so we need to inform them right away if they have a cucumber beetle population building out there. Um, and then we go through the course of the season every week, looking at those, we, we identify when powdery mildew begins uh, on those crops so that they begin their fungicide program. And we also track what the research farm and Andy does this as well. Um, cucurbit downy mildew. Uh, we, we each have sentinel plots that are part of a larger network so that we can keep growers abreast of when the organism gets here and when it does what races uh, are in the infestation so that they know what crops need to be protected because 
invariably it's a cucumber disease and then there are cert certain years other crops are affected too and what we hope doesn't happen is pumpkins to be infected because um, you know a typical north jersey grower may have a half acre of cucumbers but 30 or 40 or 50 or more acres of pumpkins and so there's a big difference in terms of insecticide or i'm sorry fungicide applications so they need to know the difference uh, in the races, which we can do for them. <clears throat> and so this happens twice a week. Insect survey traps are checked each visit. Uh, we, we derive uh, spray schedules for sweet corn in the silking stage from the catches we make of corn earworm. Uh, European corn borer catches help us focus our scouting activities in corn. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a busy day for the kids. They um, they spend a good long day each day out there working with their, their group of growers. And I, I, make, I make daily visits with the, with the technicians as well. So uh, I have three. I spend one full day a week with each of them. Uh, and then one day on the farm and one day to put out brush fires. <laughs> Sentinel quads, what's that? Um, Sentinel plot and Andy can expand on oh, this. Plot. Is that a plot? I'm it's, sorry. It's a, a plot. Andy has Andy has one. I, I have one in, in North Jersey, but for cucurbit downy mildew, it's a it's a plot that contains uh, cucumbers, musk melons, watermelons, acorn squash, butternut squash, kabocha, and then I throw a few other things in there too. So I have um, jack o' lanterns, and I have a second cucumber variety that has some resistance to downy mildew. And so we plant them and we do not treat them with fungicides. Uh, the idea being that we, we want to know exactly when downy mildew, the downy mildew organism shows up in our area. And when it does, which crops among those that we have in the Sentinel are being infected because that, that can really provide the information that growers need to limit fungicide applications. So they only apply fungicides to what they need to. We learned about this from Andy last time he was yep. talking talking to us. So that's really interesting. So you're planting a plot with all these different varieties of squash. And my understanding is that the different races of the downy mildew will only affect one particular type of squash. So you're able to identify. Andy? Well, there, there's, a, there's actually two groups or clades, they call them. Clade one and clade two. One clade... Uh, predominantly only infects uh, cucumbers and cantaloupes, melons, and then the other group or clade will infect all the other cucurbit hosts. So right now in New Jersey, we, we have found uh, cucumber downy mildew on cucumber, uh, which you first identified on June 16th, and then about five days later on June 21st, I think we found it on cantaloupe. And that's what we would expect because that clade primarily infects those two crops. Uh, what's interesting, and I was out at the farm today, is he has a whole field of cucumbers, cantaloupes, squashes, and melons, you know, right next to each other. Same field, just different blocks. And, and the only two crops that were infected. Uh, as of today, we're, we're still just the cucumbers and, and the cantaloupes. All right, so what, what that tells us is that if you're a cucumber or, or cantaloupe grower in the state, you, you need to apply fungicides to help control downy mildew on those two crops. Uh, if you're growing pumpkins and, and summer squash and other things, you can wait because the pathogen, you know, that primarily affects those cucumber crops isn't present in the state. And as Chris said, we, we don't want growers to spray uh, fungicides when they don't have to. So it, it's, a, it's a bit of a warning system. And then it just kind of helps us make recommendations because we, you know, uh, we don't want to put out a, we don't want every cucurbit grower in the state, you know, growing every different crop to, to spray if they don't have to. And it's basically, it, it's, it, it's a money saving thing and fungicide saving thing, unnecessary sprays or, or something we, we, we try to avoid. I'm thinking maybe we'll, um, since, we're, since we jumped to Andy, why don't, Andy, why don't we have you talk a little bit about how you got into what you do and, and what you do and, and we can come back to everybody for 
um, specific questions. Sure, sure. My, my name my name's Andy, Andy Winant. I am the extension specialist in, in vegetable pathology uh, for Rutgers, you know, and the New Jersey Ag Experiment Station. I've been, uh, and this will be my 17th summer in New Jersey. I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. I graduated in 2004 uh, from The Ohio State University uh, with a degree in, in plant pathology. Uh, my master's uh, was done on processing tomatoes, looking at cover crop mulches to uh, limit disease development on, on processing tomatoes. And then my, my PhD was done on uh, Fusarium fruit rot of, of pumpkin, which is a serious disease in, 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 in Ohio. But Unfortunately, we don't have any fusarium fruit rot in, in New Jersey, which is a really good thing. Uh, but we don't want it in New Jersey. Uh, so I've been here, like I said, this will be my 17th summer. Uh, what I do is I work with Chris and Joe, as well as I work with all, all the county agents. And if a grower has a particular problem uh, with the disease, uh, they'll reach out to the county agents or, or someone like Joe or Chris if it's, an, if it's a bug question. Uh, and then if they need, they need more help, you know, they come to uh, someone like myself, uh, you know, for, for my help or, or answers and so forth. Uh, I'm stationed down at, at RARIC, which is the Rutgers Research Station in Bridgeton, New Jersey. Uh, that, uh, this is where we do all the vegetable, uh, a lot of the vegetable research in the state, particularly pathology wise. Uh, we do some with Snyder as well. Uh, but I run my own research program. As Chris said, I, you know, we do the sentinel plot work uh, with cucurbit dining mildew, but I also do a lot of fungicide evaluation trials, whether it be conventional or organic products, uh, because we, uh, we only like to recommend thing, uh, products that, that work, uh, where if you're in other states or regions, that, uh, those, uh, those groups are uh, what we put out, we call them laundry lists. Of products, so anything really labeled for a crop, crop disease or a pest, uh, will make it into their production guides. But uh, the Mid Atlantic uh, guide is much different. Uh, I would recommend to all the organic growers, even though it's a conventional guide for conventional farmers, all the information you need on variety selection, seeding rates, planting dates uh, is in there. So it'd be a valuable tool to have. You can find the Mid-Atlantic Production Guide, a vegetable production guide online through our Rutgers Plant Pest Advisory website. And if you're not signed up for the Rutgers Plant Pest Advisory Vegetable Crops Edition, uh, I would highly recommend that everybody does, does so because that's where all this information gets disseminated, whether it be Chris's IPM reports, Joe's reports, or you know, if we find something unusual or something in the state, you know, I put out a report or blog, whatever you want to call it, as well as many other people, county agents and so forth do. So that's really your, is one thing everyone should be signed up for. Uh, there's a lot of great information on diseases, pests, and, as well as weed control there. Uh, other than that, I, you know, I run my own research program. I have an open, open diagnostic clinic down here. So if you know, a county agent or, or a grower or a crop consultant in the region has an issue. They, they usually call me on the phone and just tell me, you know, when they're dropping by. And I, you know, I'll look at their sample. Uh, if it's a disease, you know, you know, 95% of the time I can tell them what's going on uh, and how to treat it. Uh, every once in a while, I'll, I'll get a, a bug sample, which I will politely say I need to talk to Joe with Joe with and I'll pass along that sample or question to Joe or Chris. Uh, I only do the, the disease part of the, uh, but it works out well. And if Joe or Chris has a disease problem or question, we, you know, we pass people along to each other so they get to the right person so they get the answer they need. Andy, can you share any um, products that you have identified as being useful for organic farmers? When it, well, the, the, the two main ones that most organic farmers need to have or probably already already have are, are would be organic hoppers and uh, your organic sulfurs. Uh, organic coppers in general, the coppers in general uh, work best uh, on, on bacterial diseases. 
So if you have a bacterial leaf spot of pepper, an angular leaf spot on cucurbit or, or other crops, you, and when you think of bacterial disease control, you, you always want to think uh, of coppers first. And that's traditionally what's been used in the past and for a very long time. There's a caveat to that, uh, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. Uh, and the other product would be sulfur, you know, traditionally for cucurbit powdery mildew control. Uh, works very well. Uh, you know, what you need to know about both of these products is they're they're preventative, so they need to be applied uh, before the pathogen uh, or disease is present or is just beginning. Uh, and you always want to, and they're applied, you know, protective fungicides, copper and sulfur, is they're, they're, they're run off or, or dissipate or the leaf surface over time following rain. So they have to be regularly applied, usually on a weekly basis. Uh, so you remain, you, you always have a constant, constant level of copper on the foliage. Uh, and a good example of this is a, a pumpkin crop. You know, one week it may be at vine tip, right? And you can spray over the top and you hit it all. But that next week it may grow five or six feet of new growth, okay? And that's then that means all that new growth is unprotected. So you have to go in seven days later and, and protect that new growth, uh, uh, you know, to try to, you know, to help prevent the disease development. And that's basically why, you know, when we talk about weekly fungicide programs, uh, whether they be conventional or organic, you know, it's always to, you're always out there to protect the newest growth uh, uh, as you go throughout the season, as well as protect fruit when fruit starts to, to develop. Uh, the one thing we have found in New Jersey in, in the past couple of years on conventional farms is the, the bacterial leaf spot pathogen of both pepper and tomato can become resistant to copper applications. Uh, so we started this work a couple of summers ago, and we be, would be glad to work with any organic farm that has a bacterial leaf spot problem. Uh, we can now help them identify which species of Xanthomonas is, is present on their farm. Uh, technically, there, there could be four. Uh, but more importantly, we, we can run a test, and I work with Dr. Don Kobayashi and, and his team up on campus. We can, we can, they can actually determine now if the bacteria uh, are resistant to copper sprays, all right? And in that case, no amount of copper that you apply is gonna help mitigate your, your bacterial problem. Uh, and that's, it, that's free. Uh, so only, you know, only, all you have to do is reach out to me. Uh, Chris has been doing some scouting in North Jersey for me. Uh, now, I've been looking around down here and other county agents are, are helping out. So if, if, if you've been, organic growers have been heavily involved in spraying coppers over X number of years, and they don't feel like their copper is working anymore, much like on a conventional farm, you know, they need to reach out to us. We can come out and collect samples, uh, get them to campus, and we can uh, we determine what species are present and, and whether copper resistance is present on that farm. Because again, you know, organic growers don't need to be spraying any more copper than in anybody else. And if the, the copper is not going to work, uh, there's no need, uh, no need to spray it. Can you talk about some other uh, organic strategies? I know you were talk you were um, talking previously about um, the importance of rotating cucurbit crops to you know to avoid yeah. certain diseases. Yes, and, and by far, you know, if you're organic con grower, you're one of the best ways you can mitigate disease development is have a really good crop rotation, and, and that means not putting you know similar crops in the same spot every single summer all right and certain pathogens can can uh, infect different crops so as Chris mentioned earlier the phytophthora blight uh, which we see uh, endemic in, in, in most of South Jersey uh, not only can it infect peppers and non-bell peppers but it can also infect eggplant uh, tomatoes as well as all the cucurbit crops all right. So if, if you have a phytophthora problem, 
the last thing you want to do is plant tomatoes or pepper in the same field where you had a cucurbit or eggplant crop uh, the year before. Uh, and you know, Phytophthora is by far the most economically damaging or most economically important pathogen in, in, in the state uh, these days. It, it causes tremendous amount of, of losses and, uh, and you, you don't want it in your operation if you can avoid it. Uh, the other thing about Phytophthora is when it comes to peppers, at least, we had some really good you know, Phytophthora tolerant slash resistant bell pepper called a virus now. Uh, and, and that's your, the best way to avoid losses to Phytophthora. Again, it comes down to, to proper variety selection. And again, if, if you go to the Mid-Atlantic Production Guide, you know, you can see all the listings of, of non-bell non and bell peppers that we recommend in New Jersey and the other Mid-Atlantic states. But you also get those varieties that carry the Phytophthora resistance, as well as some have a virus resistance and so forth. Uh, nematode resistance, and, and that's your, your easiest and your best line of defense against, you know, certain pathogens uh, uh, when, it, when it comes to trying to, to avoid them. So a, a call to our crop selection is very important along with rotation. Uh, so again, uh, you know, land is, is very hard to come by in New Jersey, you know, very little farmland from the vegetable side of things is not in production every year, uh, particularly on the conventional side. Now on the organic sides, you, you probably do a lot more better rotations and have a lot more ability to rotate at the different areas of the farm than some of our conventional guys. Uh, but you always gotta remember is, is you always wanna, you know, you know, have, you know, clean, you know, good land to go to and, and just make sure you have the right crop rotation. I was on a, on a, a pepper farm our pepper field this morning, uh, they had significant Pythium Phytophthora issues. Well, and I asked the crop consultant, I said, what well, was on this farm last year? He said, I, th I think cucumbers or, or, or squash. And I said, I said, well, that's not a really good rotation. He goes, I know, the farmer knows too. But so he called me back about an hour later after you had talked to the farmer to actually get the, the right answer. He goes, yeah, unfortunately, the, the farmer had peppers in this field last year, same spot. And they had a, a ton of Phytophthora and losses last year. And he probably lost 40 acres of, of bell peppers uh, this year because right. of just poor, poor crop rotation, uh, unfortunately. So again, uh, crop rotation is, is, is very important when it comes to disease you know, mitigation as well as, go ahead. Oh, with well, something like that with the rotation, uh, I'm assuming you can't just wrote, you know, move to the field next to it. Is, is there a certain amount of distance that you need between a field that was one type of crop and then the same crop? And my my uh, advice is, is always as far away as possible. Right. Uh, obviously, that's not possible on some small farms. Uh, you know, I talk to homeowners all the time. I said, if even if your garden's twenty feet wide and twenty feet long, you know, go to that other other side of the garden and plant. You know, don't put your tomatoes or peppers in the same row or end of the garden every year. And that would be, be my advice to any conventional organic farmers. And, and most times, you know, I, I recommend this also is, 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 is have a map. Uh, if you don't map out where you had stuff, if you can't tell me where you've had certain crops over the past five or six years, all right, you're not, you're not mapping out enough. All right, if, if, you know, that pepper grower would have came to me and said, hey, I had, peppers here last year, but I had a bunch of extra plants this year and I'm just going to plant them in that same spot. I would have said, don't do it. All right. Because you're, you're not going to, you're going to lose that. You're going to lose that crop. So again, a, a good map. Uh, you don't have to be an artist. You just got to know if any particular field you should be able to walk up to or, or block and say, in your mind, you should know what you had in that field last year, the year before that, the year before that, the year before that, and the year before that. All right. 
if you can't do that, then you, you, you need to improve uh, the way you uh, keep track of things. Right. You know, one or two years isn't going to be a, enough for, for most pathogens, particularly the soil borne pathogens. So you, you want to you be out of a, a certain crop for as long as possible. Particularly if, if you have, well. yeah, insects as well. Some insects as well. So, other issues. Uh, you know, I wanted to mention the bacterial uh, leaf spot in pepper and tomatoes because I know you guys grow a lot of heirloom tomatoes. A lot of heirloom tomatoes are organic production. Uh, those are notoriously for getting bacterial problems because they lack uh, resistance. Uh, and uh, they get them back here very easily. So uh, the, the one thing I would also recommend is uh, some of you organic growers may be doing the hot water seed treatment. Uh, has, has anybody done that? You can type in the chat or, or raise your hand. Uh, I, again, if you're an heirloom tomato grower and you're, you're getting different seeds and uh, some grow many, many different varieties, uh, I would recommend hot water seed treatment to help mitigate the bacterial problems you see in, in heirloom tomatoes as well as, as, as peppers. Uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, you know, we do have sets of equipment throughout the state. Unfortunately, that was pretty much shut down last year because of COVID. And, and we have a number of growers who, who are repeat customers, right, Chris, who come in every yeah, year. I, I, it was considered essential last year, so we maintained that program. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah, through, through the, the uh, late winter, early spring, both years. Yeah, and that's something you can reach out to me or Chris too for more information. Uh, and that, and that's another way uh, to mitigate bacterial problems in, in tomatoes as well as peppers. I just want to jump back to what you where you started when you were talking about um, your your research at Ohio State, where you were working with tomatoes and and cover cropping. Mm -hmm. um, that was that sounded pretty interesting. Is that something that you found was effective? Yeah. So uh, the one issue, major issue that you pick pumpkin growers have in the state of Ohio is that they all grow pumpkins in the same spot on their farm every year because it's the closest to the farm market. Mm -hmm. It's the easiest access to, uh, to, to customers and so forth. Well, uh, after years and years of doing this, a uh, fusarium pathogen uh, uh, got into to, in, to most of those fields. And I, there wasn't a, a field I could not find, pumpkin field in Ohio that was a UPIC operation or r retail that did not have fusarium fruit rot problems. That's how, how bad it was. And unfortunately, the, the pathogen survives in the soil for a very long time. And you really can't control it with conventional fungicides because at the, the pumpkin lays on the soil surface, the fruit infects, the pathogen infects the fruit on the belly of, of, of the pumpkin. All right, that's in direct contact with the soil. So it's nearly impossible to get any sort of fungicide down to that side of the fruit. All right, so they were at a loss. So our, the, one of the things I did is I, I looked at different types of cover crop mulch, uh, spring oats, uh, winter rye, hairy vetch, uh, some living mulches, which did not work at all. And the whole idea of these mulches is that we would kill them, or in some cases, let them living on the soil surface and we would roll them down. So the mulch would act as a physical barrier. A lot of you probably do this already. So if, if we plant a rye and a vetch in, in, in the fall in Ohio, we can kill it and, you know, or kill it either chemically or kill it by undercutting or just rolling it down in May. You know, we can let it dry and down, dry down and they would no-till pumpkins through the mulch. Uh, and then as the fruit developed later on in the summer, the fruit would lie in direct contact with the mulch and not touch the soil. So the dead mulch would lie on the soil surface and prevent the pathogen spores from being splashed up or coming in direct contact with the fruit. And that's, you know, one way growers, uh, you know, we, we figured out that if growers were desperate to, to continue to grow pumpkins in the same field every year, they would have to adopt some sort of mulch 
bait system. And, and the best was really rye and hairy vetch because it provided the most amount of biomass. You really want a, a thick layer of mulch, four or five, six inches thick. That's so it's tough. there. So it's there, you know, the, the rest of the summer. Uh, you know, some of you growing tomatoes or you may, may just buy the straws of bale, you know, straw bales and break them up and just put them under the plant that you're not staking. Uh, that's what I did as a young person. Uh, we didn't stake tomatoes on the, on the small farm I worked on. We just mulched all of our tomatoes. So the plant and then the fruit development would lay on the mulch and not the soil surface later on in the season. And the mulch helps, you know, tamp down weeds as well as help maintain a, a, a good level of soil moisture through the growing season. So those are the benefits of mulch. Uh, beyond, you know, potential disease reduction. Nice. I can give a whole <laughs> other presentation on that, but it's, <laughs> it's probably for a different day. Uh, well, yeah, let's, uh, I thank you, Andy, um, yeah. for that. And uh, maybe, maybe we'll jump, Joe, if, you, if you're ready, we'll, we'll get your, um, if we could get your story and uh, some thoughts about we go. IPM management and all that. All right. Yeah. Um, I started off as a private consultant in Michigan uh, when I got out of grad school, master's degree. Um, there wasn't any jobs available, and uh, there were a group of uh, fruit growers that needed somebody to come around and scout their orchards. So the uh, local ag agent signed me up and I brought home a $600 check and my wife was ecstatic and off we went. Um, unfortunately, it didn't pan out in the long run. I was consulting about seven years there, but I, uh, I worked with uh, uh, tree fruit, um, field crops and vegetables. And so I had a really uh, wide open exposure to a lot of different crops. It was great years. Um, I learned tremendous amounts of uh, things uh, during that time. But unfortunately, I didn't know, really figure out how to run a business very well. So when Rutgers said, hey, come out here and uh, we can give you a steady paycheck, it sounded pretty good. So uh, when I moved here to, uh, to Rutgers, I was uh, working in field crops and uh, we maintained a uh, scouting program, uh, mostly down here in the south, but also up north, um, scouting crop for a uh, program for field crops and uh, primarily looking at alfalfa, but also doing some other, uh, some other crops and all. And then uh, in uh, 2000 transitioned over to vegetables and uh, have been working with vegetable crops here at Rutgers since then. Uh, Chris and I together make up the vegetable IPM program and uh, as Chris has alluded, uh, we have a number of farms. Um, I don't have quite as many farms, but the South, South Jersey farms tend to be larger than the Northern ones. And we tend to have more conventional farmers down here. Um, I have one farm currently that does have some organic production, uh, although they seem to deal with that quite well on their own. So, <clears throat> Uh, primarily, I'm working with uh, conventional farmers, and uh, but we maintain a scouting program. But it's it's a little different down here than up north because we have private consultants that are operating in the area, as well as uh, 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 corporate uh, fieldmen for the different uh, uh, pesticide companies, seed companies, and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's a little, uh, the setup is a little different down here than, than up north. And uh, so that changes things a little bit. We do some field scouting, but it's primarily sweet corn. And um, I was just tallying up. We had a, uh, we added a new farm here this year. So we're looking at right around 1200 acres of sweet corn uh, that we're, you know, putting traps out on and, uh, and or scouting. So that's a fair chunk. Uh, but uh, probably the, one of the primary things that I've worked on over the years has been soil insects, uh, wireworms and, and the like. 
and also uh, pepper weevil, which has been a nemesis here, uh, working on uh, the pepper crops. Uh, pepper weevil is a is an invasive insect that's uh, carried into the state uh, in the uh, spring, and it's released out into the field totally by accident, not not by anybody doing it deliberately. And uh, if there's any one insect pest. This should be considered to be a disease. It's pepper weevil. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm recovering from a cold. I still get a scratchy throat now and then. Yeah, I feel bad. Uh, can you talk? <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, the the pepper weevil is is different from the other insect pests because most of the time the other insect pests. One or two spray applications usually takes care of the problem. You can't do that with pepper weevil. Uh, once you have pepper weevil infestation in the field, it's a race between you and the weevil to see who's going to get the last pepper. And uh, we have we have uh, we've had farms where they've abandoned the pepper fields uh, because the weevils just overtake everything. So. Um, so in general, that's, that's kind of where, where, how I fit into the picture. I interact with Andy, as, uh, as he mentioned before, and Chris, uh, we try to deal with pest problems as they come up and, um, we're always watching for, uh, for new problems. Um, and we also do a lot of cooperation out of state. So. Uh, we're involved with um, uh, mid-Atlantic uh, researchers in both entomology and, and pathology. Can you talk a little bit about wireworms? I know I've really struggled with them. Certainly, they are interestingly been one of my worst pests with sweet corn. I first got introduced to them when I was working in South Jersey, and uh, our sweet corn crop just got infested with them. Can you talk a little bit, tell us a little bit about white wireworm life cycle and how they, how you yeah. might control them? Yeah, um, they've been considered to be a pest. Sorry, dog game in. Uh, they've been uh, considered to be a pest for over a hundred years. And yet we know very little about the biology of the wireworms. There's, uh, there's five species here in New Jersey that, uh, can cause problems with sweet corn, but the predominant one is uh, one called Melanotus commonus. And uh, commonus is probably responsible for somewhere around 90, 95% of the wireworm damage. And uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, uh, it's a very common insect. It shows up in our black light traps uh, during midsummer, uh, they can be quite abundant at times. And uh, they have a, uh, an annual flight in the, in the summer. Uh, the the Melanotus adults are brown color. They're the click beetles. They put them on the back and wait a second or two and they click and hop up. So they're fun to play with as adults, but, uh, uh, but the, <clears throat> the larvae, are very resilient insects. Um, studies have been done to see what insecticide uh, that conventional farmers could use to manage them. And uh, one extensive study that was done out in the Northwest <clears throat> showed that there was only one insecticide that apparently could kill wireworms. All the rest of them merely made them sick. And the one that could kill them took 120 days to do it. So they're tough critters to deal with. Um, there's, yeah, um, the Melanotus commonus uh, may have a life cycle in the soil where the larvae are in the soil anywhere from two to maybe six years. Nobody really knows for sure. Wow. And once you have a field that's infested with wireworms, it's gonna stay infested. Um, there are fields that uh, when I really started getting into studying them uh, back in the 90s, 
<clears throat> there were fields that had been indicated as uh, being infested with wireworms maybe eight, 10 years earlier. Go back to those same fields, put out traps, and yeah, there's the wireworms are still there and crop damaging numbers. So, <clears throat> Uh, the biggest thing is to keep track of where do you, where do you get wireworm damage? Um, is there a particular field? Is there a particular section of the field where you get damage? If you do, you kind of uh, you need to plant things there that the wireworms do not like. For example, the sweet corn. <clears throat> <clears throat> if you have an area where the sweet corn gets hit, um, then try to plant in some other site. It, one, one researcher said that the wireworms are the herpes of the insect world, because you can have a field that's infested, has crop damaging levels of wireworms there, and nothing will happen, maybe three, four years. There won't be, eight, you might get a few plants, you know, killed off, but in general, you won't notice it. And then that next year, bam, you get nailed. And sometimes it gets to a point that you don't have any other option than to uh, give up that particular crop and replant. The wireworms are just a very difficult critter to, to deal with. They prefer minimum, minimum, uh, minimum till or no till situations. That's what they prefer. And um, if it's a dry spring, I'm sorry, if it's a wet spring, that tends to increase the odds of having a problem. If it's a dry summer, that increases the odds yeah. of having trouble. And yeah. uh, thinking in terms of like uh, potatoes, uh, sweet potatoes, the root crops in summer, they're gonna be more liable to damage in a dry year. So, uh, otherwise, the wireworms haven't read any of the literature. They sort of show up whenever they feel like they, they need to. Um, it's interesting, they're primarily predators. And so I asked uh, a wireworm specialist, well, what's the deal then? Why are they attacking plants? And he said, no, they're stressed. Well, New Jersey is a good place to get stressed. So maybe <laughs> that's the answer, I don't know. But- um, Stress reductions programs. Yes, yes. Um, probably the best thing that you can do uh, organically against wireworms, if, you if you're unfortunately having a field that is infested, till it up as frequently as possible. Make life miserable for the, the wireworms. Um, as you have a tractor, uh, field equipment going across the field and you'll see a flock of birds coming along behind. They're after the, the wire worms, the white grubs and so on. So the more you can work up the soil, uh, keep them moving, uh, make, it, make it tough for them. That's probably one of the best things you can do to minimize them. Thanks. Folks, anybody uh, that's visiting and listening to these uh, experts telling their story, if anybody has any questions, uh, now is a great time to um, just unmute yourself. And... Yeah, I have a hey, question. Jared? Yeah. Hey, um, are you guys familiar with Dr. Elaine Ingham of Food Soil Web? She talks a lot about balancing microbial and fungal activity in the soil and how by planting perennial cover crops alongside more robust crops, you can avoid rotating crops as frequently to continue benefiting the naturally occurring symbiosis between whatever fungal activity or microbial activity is existing between your cash crop and what's in the soil. So an example would be planting brassicas year on year in a single area because brassicas are known to break up fungal mycorrhizal networks, but handle some microbial activity really well with the benefit being that year after year, that microbial synergy with those brassicas over time would build a much stronger synergy. And, and likewise with crops that uh, 
benefit from some synergies with fungal mycorrhizal networks. So I guess the question is managing mycorrhizal so, so, fungi. No, because the, the common practice and, and part of what organic tries to push is crop rotation. I practice it. Right. But I only have two acres in production. I'm a small farm. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about my tomato fields, we're talking about like 4,000 square feet. And preferably that's under cover. And I don't have unlimited space to have all of my tomato fields under cover. And there's only so much new compost I can put into that space year after year before I have a mountain, like a literal mountain, not a figurative mountain. So at a certain point, I can't keep putting compost there. And, or I have to do it in such limited quantities over time. So basically like if I wanna grow my tomatoes structurally and systemically, in my system, how I want to grow them with a lower and lean system in a covered space, which is preferable for the tomatoes so I can get them in early, yada, yada. I am trying to figure out ways where I don't have to rotate as often. And I'm trying to understand the implications of doing or not doing that. And, and Elaine Ingham is someone I found who advocates for not doing it, which I thought was interesting. And I, and I think she's uh, advocating like sort of very managed mixes of compost teas, right? I mean, is that is that what you're getting at? Is the that if no? We were... She's she's getting at the fact that certain crops like brassicas interact with the soil in a particular way, and prefer not to have heavy levels of fungal activity prefer not to have heavy levels of mycorrhizal networks involved in the soil in which they're growing. That's a general, uh, a general uh, thing. So, and vice versa with other crop groups. And her point is that if you're rotating crop groups like brassicas after cucurbids, after alliums, after nightshades, to try to get away from all of these things that I think most of us who are organic farmers um, and our three presenters have talked about, learned about, become impassioned about because we've heard of all of these stories of any number of soil-borne fungal or pest or whatever disease that rotating helps deplete the ability of those diseases or pathogens to proliferate. But um, her whole thesis is that you're doing the wrong thing because if you're rotating something that likes no mycorrhizal after something that wants a lot of mycorrhizal, then its interaction with the soil throughout its lifetime is going to be antithetical to the, the crop before it and after it, if it's in the example I'm using. And I'm sorry to keep it so broad and like. No, I, I mean, I think, I think the, uh, if, if I can take, a little uh, initiative here, Jared, and, and and spin it a little bit to ask our guests to talk about, um, you know, the increasing talk about mycorrhizal fungi in soil and the relevance to agricultural systems. Is that is that a fair avenue to pursue? Sure, it's not the question, but yeah, we can talk about that. What type of soil do you have? Is it sandy? Sandy loam, seventy-one percent sandy loam uh, for the first eighteen inches. Pretty. Pretty lucky. And what's your organic matter? Uh, my last test was a year ago. I haven't tested again, but we started two years ago. On a, it's very different uh, across the fields, but on average, it was about 2.4, 2.5. And in 2019, in 2020, it was on average about 6.5. And I'd assume now it's closer to 7, 8 and hopefully around nine by the end of the year. What, wow. what, what are you doing to raise the organic matter that quickly? Compost. What, hmm. what, what type of compost? Um, I have an organic mushroom grower who I work with. So I take all of his mushroom blocks and I use that in my compost. And then I use Vermont compost, like a lot of it. And then some local New Jersey compost and all of, I, I mean, I just, I pay premiums for the highest quality stuff and it shows. And then I fertigate with Neptune's harvest and have a pretty serious regimen 
of uh, amendments that all go into it. So tons of humic acid went into the field last year, a um, couple hundred pounds over the two acres um, to, to jumpstart that. Uh, tons of uh, micronutrients via azomite and kelp meal. Um, I use alfalfa meal as well. Uh, and then um, I also ranged my chickens, my broiler chickens over cover crop uh, everywhere um, I was gearing up to plant through the first year. Just, just, uh, uh, I'm, I'm really not into mycorrhizae. Uh, I know the more that you have, the better the plant, but from what you're describing, I'm, it's amazing that you don't have cabbages that are, you know, 40 pound heads and so on. I mean, it sounds like you're pumping up the soil with just, you know, enormous amounts of nutrients. Yeah, do you have a complete soil test? Uh, again, I, I had complete soil tests from last year. I'd be happy to share them with you. But yeah, sure. What what sort of levels? I'm sorry. What what sort of levels are you seeing for potassium? Um, oh, uh, let me go look. Uh, they're off the charts. Basically, I was told, um, like, please don't add more than you have to. <laughs> uh, and I said, I won't add more than I have to because it cost me a lot to add more. Um, yeah, so before my test, so in 2019 in, in the South Field, which is where my tomatoes are now, I had 340 phosphorus, 55 potassium, 104 magnesium, and 588 calcium. And we're slightly boron deficient across the board, so I use solubor. Um, and I don't know, that's sorry, I may have a bad baseline because I didn't test that field again until this year. Um, yeah, you, you, your nutrient levels sound fine. Uh, I, I would agree, if you want to save some money, stop adding stuff. You know, you can um, go a couple of years and... Uh, um, hmm. Yeah, so again, I appreciate the recommendation and that that is the plan. I've stopped buying amendments and my my inputs will go down and down. And the whole business plan was to invest upfront in high quality compost and amendments and amend in good chunks at first and then slow it down rapidly and then just test and moderate for the next half decade and then stop testing um, as long as everything stayed status quo. And we're on track for that. But my question, again, would be like in a field where all the tests, the soil tests say like, you're doing fine, right? And I'm not seeing massive amounts of any particular disease. Like sure we have downy mildew and powdery mildew. And I think we're always gonna have those to some degree. And um, I have cucumber beetles, I have Colorado potato beetles. Uh, these are things I contend with via spraying organic pesticides or herbicides um, or fungicides. And uh, the next stage of this is saying like, okay, in my decade long crop rotation plan, if I am space limited and structurally limited, such that I want to keep my tomatoes in the same place, let's say for a five year stretch, maybe that makes a lot of sense from a systems perspective and a business perspective. It makes sense to do it. I can build things that will make it really easy for me year on year to reap more and more profit off of those tomatoes because I can invest in structure and uh, style basically, right? Um, and the team will know how to plant, knows that area, yada, yada. You know, what, what, what's the theory there? Because we always hear rotate, 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 rotate. Every year you will decrease all the chances of, you know, one disease that you didn't have a lot of at the end of the year when the plants are starting to die off, getting into the soil, overwintering, you put them there again next year, crap, next year, spring, that fungal disease or that pest pops up and, and you have all these issues. But what I'm saying with regard to Dr. Ling Ingham's thesis, and I'm not saying she's right, I'm asking you guys if you agree that there can be benefits and there can be moderation through 
a perennial base layer of cover crop paired with a cash crop and not rotate it, therefore I, benefiting. Sorry. I, I don't I don't think a perennial crop has any bearing on disease in the soil. Okay. If you can't if you can't rotate because you're let your space limited, then then you do what you can do. The, because you're limited, the best thing you can do is exclude disease. There are diseases that that you can be your own worst enemy by discarding stuff that that you purchase elsewhere or whatever. You never want to put that in your field because you get phytophthora that way. And, and I'm sure that's 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 academic, right? But in your situation, your best option is to continue to do what you're doing. Just don't introduce anything. Um, I mean, these things don't develop in a, in, in, out of nowhere. You know, the, as you say, the, the, the airborne things you contend with, it's the soil-borne things, the verticilliums, the, the phytophthoras, the pythiums. If they're not there now, they, they, they have to get there somewhere and you just don't want to be the agent that does that. Um, you, you rotate as, as well or as little as, you, as you're able to. Um, I, don't, I don't really see a connection between the soil-borne diseases that we're talking about and, and, a, and a perennial crop. Now, there are good reasons to have perennial, perennial crops like beetle berms and so forth like that, but mainly to harbor beneficial insects. There are great reasons to grow brassicas and, and, and incorporate the tissue into the soil when you're done because they liberate chemicals that are pretty rough on certain pathogens and insects. But I, I, don't, I just don't see a connection between... I, I'd follow up with, uh, with that from Chris in that um, exactly, I, I, one of our farmers, I think has been growing sweet corn in the same field for 30 years. He doesn't rotate it out of it. And, uh, and the sweet corn is doing fine. Um, the whole business about rotation comes just as Chris uh, says, if you, if you have a disease that is brought in develops and becomes, you know, a, a, a root disease, cell borne disease, then you've got to look at rotation. But if that never happens, you're fine. And, um, and the guy that's, that's been raising the sweet corn in this field for 30 years, year after year after year, gets great crop and crops of sweet corn out of it. So as Chris suggested, if, it, if it's working, don't change it. Okay, cool. Thank you. What's a beetle berm? Who is it? Who is it, Joe? Is it from Michigan? It's Michigan State, right? Uh, Doug uh, Landis. Doug Landis, yes. Yeah. So it's it's the idea that you you set aside portions, strips in particular, in your fields, um, perhaps raised up a little bit, and you plant perennial. Uh, plants in there, a mixture, and I, I'm sure there's a, there's a recipe for this, but I mean, a, a mixture of flowering plants that are perennials and some shrub-like things, and it stays there in perpetuity. And what that does is provide habitat um, for things like carabid beetles, which would be predatory or you know, certain things like that, that can range from the berm out into the field and clean up some things for you. But, but not, not just that, the flowering plants, which, which our boss, Dr. Uh, George Hamilton, has done some extensive work on. Um, flowering plants of, of a certain type or certain types are very attractive to predators and parasites that are very adept at eating insect eggs uh, or parasitizing things like aphids. Um, and so those, those, those insects require alternate carbohydrate and protein sources, which would be the pollen and the, and the nectar from some of these flowering plants. You encourage the adults to be in the area, and then they go into the crops to seek prey for their young, or you know, a place to reproduce. So um, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty well established um, way of thinking, anyway. But, uh, but that's how have it you works. seen that uh, being applied in New Jersey? Um, I have some growers that uh, they'll they'll plant some of those flowering plants nearby. I even have one grower that will uh, skip every you know, every 10th cabbage plant and fill the hole with alyssum, uh, you know, to have those flowers there available. But uh, generally what we tell people is it's not a bad idea ever to put your dill, uh, your, your cilantro 
near your vegetable crops and allow some of it to go to flower. Um, buckwheat's never a bad idea if you need something to fill in space near a field. Um, these things encourage some of the some of the right insects to come in. We also tell people that you know there's no reason to kill weeds if they're not in your field, right? Because weeds flower too, and wild carrots a great attractor of uh, or Queen Anne's lace is a great attractor of some beneficial insects. So um, if they're in flower and you don't need to mess with them, leave them be. Other questions from the audience? Feel free to just unmute yourself and. Um, I mean, I guess. I'm sorry, is, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm really worried. I have like these little kind of, it's, they're only in the back of my garden, but I have like these little white specks. I, 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 I think they're fungus, but I'm not 100% confident enough, but I'm a little bit worried about them. I'm wondering if I'm overwatering or what I can do to like remove them properly without damaging what I'm growing. That was probably like the most kindergarten way I could have worded that question, but I'm only a beginner, so. What what crop, Justin? What what did they grow? What did you see them on? Um, well, it's it's mainly in the back where I'm growing um, kale and kohlrabi. Are they on the soil surface? Yeah. Like bird's nest fungi. Andy. Possible. Hello. Can you can you walk out there and show us? Are you mobile? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go mobile. Don't let me get away without. I want to mention an organic sweet corn trial that Joe and I are going to be involved in this summer. Um, but I don't want to interrupt yeah, what's going on now. Down. But I don't want to miss yeah. it either. Or do you see? Oh, we had we had an image coming in, but then you maybe turned off your camera. Uh oh, I could I could see it. Oh, 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 oh! That's on the mulch. Yeah, yeah. It, it started. <laughs> a few, I, I started it a few days ago. It started about seven days ago, and that started about two days ago. So I was a little concerned. Is this a, is this a, a slime mold? Where'd you get I your guess. mulch? Where'd you get your mulch from? A uh, gardening store in my town. Would. So probably so now. So there's a lot of different funguses and molds, right? They're not always bad. So like that might be breaking down the wood mulch and might not affect crop. Yeah, your mulch, what we call, might be a little hot. I mean, it's it's not as decomposed as it should have been. And in that case, that's sometimes where you see some of these other molds, you know, sometimes mushrooms and things like that. It may be a slime mold. Uh, uh, sometimes they call it uh, the dog bar fungus. Uh, <laughs> Justin, you need to point the camera at the soil. Yeah. So, <laughs> he did. So like often, you know, I'll get questions like, you know, and it looks like dog barf. It looks like the dog barfed on your mulch. <laughs> uh, but those are typically slime, you know, slime molds. They're pretty non-harmful. Justin, I would say if, if, if you got a rake, just kind of rake that up a little bit. Uh, okay. and with this hot weather and that, uh, you know, it'd probably just disappear on its own. Just rake okay. that around a little bit with a, your, a little hand rake or a little shovel or something, and it'll probably just dry up and disappear on its own. But okay. it's, it's most likely, you know, from the mulch you put down on the soil service there. To... We've got a question uh, in the chat. Jumping worms? I've never heard of jumping worms. Is, is that a problem in New Jersey? Amen. <laughs> it's a problem in my yard. <laughs> they're, they're awful things. I can't picture um, a jumping worm. It looks like it's a regular earthworm. They're just they they live in the top two inches of the soil. They degrade mulch rapidly, um, and they are they they wriggle violently when they're exposed to you, know, you, you sweep the you sweep the mulch away. <clears throat> but they 
uh, their castings are not clumpy like nor like our you know our endemic earthworms. They are very granular and uh, and separate. And so what you get between your mulch layer and the soil surface is this ever increasing layer of what um, worm people refer to as like coffee ground style uh, droppings. And what 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 does what it does is it causes the soil to not hold water well, not retain water well. Uh, and of course it, it leaches nutrients more readily. Um, I have had these things push out seedlings. Wow. Uh, they're, 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 a, they're a complete mess. Um, I'm, and we had a, we had a Joe, Joe invited a speaker from, I think it was Vermont, Joe. Yeah. Um, uh, who, who had done some research on them. Um, he's, he's very concerned about their effect on forests and, but, but our concern is that is they might be in, in imported, you know, if you if you import, um, you know, municipal leaves or something that you might you might bring them to your farm, and it's a serious concern. Yeah, uh, this fellow didn't have a didn't have a strong opinion on whether they would be problematic <clears throat> for for agriculture or not. But just thinking about um, people like uh, Justin and and other people to have smaller areas, backyard areas where they're trying to do organic growing. Uh, I could see where jump, jumping worms might become a, a real problem. So the question I see is, can they get them from anything brought onto the farm? I think your main concerns are going to be leaf litter. Um, if, you, if you're a farmer that, in, that in, in incorporates municipal leaves uh, or possibly mulch, and I'm thinking about mulch that's bought in bulk. Uh, which I suspect is how we have it in my neighborhood. Um, neighbors used a landscaper who brought in mulch in a, in a dump truck. And uh, within a couple of years, they were in that side of the yard. And now I, I'm amazed at how fast they got to the other side of the house. Uh, and they, they are, um, they're, they're, they're a problem. Um, I'm not sure what to do about it <laughs> other than just, just I sweep the mulch aside every once in a while and chuck them in the street and make the robins happy. I, I don't know <laughs> what else to do, really. They uh, uh, they have a very rapid uh, life cycle. They uh, they only live about a year. They lay one batch of eggs in the fall. The eggs hatch out in the spring, and uh, <clears throat> they're very prolific. And so uh, you can go from just a few to very large numbers in a single year, and that's what that's what makes them bad especially they uh they will tend to crowd out the the endemic earthworms and uh like chris is saying you wind up with coffee grounds i think uh i think we want to uh, maybe chris if you want to tell us a little bit about the trial that you mentioned uh the sweet corn trial and then maybe yeah. we'll wrap up with any questions and and let you guys go yeah, this, this is uh, something that, that I've been interested in a while because um, it, the, the organic spinosin uh, and trust has really put sweet corn production within reach um, for organic farmers with regard to earworm control in particular, because um, for those of you who are frustrated by the fact that your, your organic customers are, are, are no less, or I should say no more tolerant of, of earworms in, in the corn than normal, than, than conventional customers are, um, that can be pretty frustrating. But Entrust is, is an exceptional material for that. The problem is you can only use it twice in succession. And, and if you're trying to grow sweet corn uh, in, the, in the second half of the summer, um, in order to effectively keep that, that, those ears earworm free, you're really looking at a, a schedule that's going to require you to treat every four days, probably at a minimum, sometimes every three days. Um, and you can't do that in a regulatory sense and trust can only be used twice and you can use it for a maximum of six applications um, and that includes pre-silking too so if you were to use it for fall armyworm that would take one application off of the menu so the question then is what to do to uh, space in alternate materials that have some efficacy against corn earworm to make this this situation manageable um, and one of the things recently that that has shown some promise against earworm, which is a, which is a pest of other crops, um, is, is a nuclear polyhedrovirus, um, which is specific to the, the genus Helicoverpa, which, which corn earworm belongs to. 
Um, and so we, we have a trial this year using this product. It's called Helogen um, by a company that I believe is called BioNTech. Um, I could be wrong. It's an Australian company, but they've, they've shipped out a gallon of this. Um, and if you know, it, it trials where, where researchers have treated hemp, um, soybeans, things where the earworm consumes a lot of foliage that it can be coated with these virus particles. It looks pretty good. It, it liquefies the, the, the earworm. The trick with, with corn is that the, the earworm lays her eggs on the silks and then the earworm rapidly traverses those silks into the tip of the ear and then is out of, uh, out of reach from an insecticide. So the question we have is not so much will the, will the viral virus particles kill the earworm, it's will the earworm consume enough uh, in that period to, 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 to take on a lethal dose. And so um, I've been, been working with the, the, the chief scientist with that company, um, and we have decided that we're going we're gonna to try and really saturate that plant with um, this viral product in between and trust application. So we will be using um, decreasing numbers of entrust applications while we increase the halogen applications. And at the end, um, see what kind of results we get. And, and in the hopes that at the end, we'll have some regimen there where we uh, can come up with a decent crop uh, and still stay on the right side of the regulations with regard to entrust applications. Um, is this I mean, a not, trial that- I'm not super doing, confident, but I'm, I'm hopeful. Is this a trial being done at the Rutgers uh, Research Farm? It's at the Snyder Farm in, uh, in Pittstown. And how big a plot do you have to do to do a trial like this? Uh, my rows are, well, they're 120 feet long, but that's going to be five. So it'll be, it'll be, I think it's six or seven different treatments. I don't have the spreadsheet in front of me now with, with four replicates each. So they're going to be um, you know, like 20 foot sections replicated four times. We'll be spraying with a tractor with a, a, a boom. Um, and we'll go with about 40 gallons to the acre of the product. Because so we really want to wet these plants down. And it will be done on a three-day schedule because the time, the, the planting date uh, will undoubtedly bring this corn plot into silk in the heart of, of earworm season. So we'll see. Is there a, um, a good way to find out about what's going on at Snyder Research Farm? Do they have a, a specific website or? Um, they have a website where they sometimes will update with what research trials are there. I don't know the status of the, uh, the twilights. They, they typically hold a couple of twilight meetings every year, yeah. um, which are advertised through the counties and then people come out. Um, sometimes there's even a cookout, but I, I just don't know what, what Rutgers is permitting these days uh, on their research farms. But, but for sure, um, the results will be at the Vegetable Growers Association because if they're funding this research, so um, we, will, we will be reporting it there. So that'll be, it'll be in the compendium. Um, That's cool. Yeah. I mean, obviously all the organic farmers that do um, vegetable production try and get some sweet corn in there and I'm sure there are a lot of farmers that'd be very interested. We might even think about if you have interesting learning, we should um, we should probably do a little session when you get the learning. We can push the information out to people. It'd be great. Yeah, yeah. We we would pro probably Joe and I would put this in the plant and pest advisory as well. At least a summary of the results. Great, great. Thank you very much for mentioning that. Yeah, I basically want to give you guys the last word. If you have anything, um, new diseases, new insects, um, or things that have been effectively controlled, uh, anything you want to tell us about that you're, is you're thinking about, or um, you know, is it change? Does things change that much? Maybe they don't. Maybe it's more sort of. I mean, you, you all have been doing this for a long time, so maybe there isn't a lot of new developments, but. Um, any thoughts before we, before we wrap up? From a disease standpoint, it's this year's pretty, uh, it's pretty typical. Nothing, nothing out of, out of alignment other than the, other than the fact that both basil, 
Downy Mildew and Inky Kerbet Downy Mildew showed up so early in June is a little bit worrisome, but that probably has mostly to do uh, with weather patterns. Uh, as of right now, uh, neither, as, as far as we know, neither basal downy mildew or cucurbit downy mildew were, were, would survive the winter in the mid-Atlantic region because it, it gets too cold and the pathogen doesn't produce, at least, you know, not in the lab, but out in the field, it doesn't produce an overwintering structure. So both those pathogens have to come up uh, from the southern states each year. Uh, so that's why we monitor them so closely. So that's one reason why if, if you don't, you know, subscribe to our, our plant pest advisory vegetable crops edition, uh, you should, because as soon as we learn this information or know about it, you know, uh, we let every, everyone know. I, I will, I'll share the home screen. If you let me share my screen, Mike, just so people. I think you, there should be a little green square down yeah the i'm being denied by the host to, to share oh, that's that's is that nikki. that's nikki so she's maybe try again okay so oop, that's her screen <laughs> uh okay let me find so just can can everyone see that yep yeah, so this is this is what the, the plant pest homepage looks like. If you were to click on it, and, and if you want to describe, you would just click this button here, here and you get an email message or uh, through your other, other device. You know, and it, as soon as I post something, uh, uh, it, gets, it gets posted to the, to the website and then you get a link to the emails. And not only do you, you get the insect stuff that Chris and Joe do, you know, you also get the, the food safety stuff uh, information that Wes Klein does and Meredith Melendez does. Uh, you get weed information, uh, you know, a lot about food safety, a lot of stuff about COVID. If you're having people on your on your operation or if you run a CSA uh, and it's just a, a lot of information. So here this is just in our report last week. Uh, just I do this weekly just on things that are pathogens that are active in the state. So uh, these are things growers should be looking for or, or at least scouting for. And you can see, you know, we got the cucumber downy mildew, you know, from the 16th. Uh, obviously, if you're a cucumber grower, this is what uh, you, you want to look for to see if you had cucumber downy mildew, as well as just other information. Awesome. Uh, again, not of its you know, some of it may not be directly related to organic production, but all the, you guys are going to have the same insect and disease issues that any other grower are going to have. Uh, and then more importantly, as I said earlier, if you're, you're interested in, in, in certain variety types and what we recommend, uh, you know, growing in New Jersey, uh, this is our, our, our plant pest advisory recommendations. And for example, if we just click on, you know, summer squash here, you know, from a, you can print the whole guide out or print it out by section. Again, the, the variety of recommendations are here. Again, and you have to remember that all the, all the, the breeding for vegetable diseases, that's all done, you know, you know, through natural sources. So none of this is our GMO crops. But again, if you're looking to grow summer squash, and you're looking to control or limit your losses to, you know, the five important viruses that affect summer squash, you know, you might think about growing Conqueror, Conqueror 3, which has resistance to our, our two most prevalent viruses. Again, and you can just use this information to, to make your call to our selections based on disease resistance, as well as uh, insect resistance uh, for some of these crops. So it's, it's a valuable resource for you guys. Yeah. Uh, just the plant pest as well as the, the, again, and that's free. And you can get it in hard copy form uh, from your county office, but again, you can also get it free uh, online here. So it doesn't cost you a thing. Thank you for pulling that up. Yeah. That is a very powerful resource. All right. I, uh, I really want to thank you guys for taking the time to come talk to us and tell us about what you're doing. 
and um, I hope you don't get too hot out there. I hope things will mild, get a little bit milder. Keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, my 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 phone line is always open, uh, so you can. You know, I get calls quite a bit, so if you have questions, you can. Easiest way to reach me is via cell phone. Great. And well, I'll give you my. Uh, oh, that's six oh, six oh nine. I'm not giving you the wrong cell phone on no, <laughs> no, it's so again or email me uh, uh you, red, at my redgers and that's easiest way to get reach me this time of year yeah andy you sent that direct to me oh i'm sorry <laughs> joe you already have my phone number all yes, right i do all right all right guys i i'm serious this time yeah so we've got our resources the plant and pest advisory website Definitely any grower in New Jersey should be aware of that. We've got the Mid-Atlantic Production Guide, which is uh, also a very good resource. And then um, Chris mentioned the Vegetable Growers Association. Is that the convention in Atlantic City? Yeah, the, yeah, the annual yeah. meeting, which is, uh, has been in February the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, but in the Plant and Pest Advisory, whether it's Andy's um, disease updates uh, or whether it's Joe and, and my uh, vegetable IPM update, we will often put links in there um, to sources of information that we think are important. One of the ones that shows up all the time is the cucurbit downy mildew forecast site, which is just phenomenal. Um, NIWA is another one, which is a, a weather system, a weather station network um, coordinated by Cornell. That will be in the newsletter occasionally if you can. You can use that to model um, for predicting emergence of certain things like onion maggot, cabbage maggot. Um, so it's all, it's all good stuff. We, uh, we don't just report on what we're seeing here, but we report on how you can find uh, up-to-date information from other sources as well. Nice. All right, well, uh, thank you again. And yeah. um, Nagisa, anything before we sign off? No, just thank you very much for your time, guys. Really helped a lot. And uh, I think everyone will really appreciate the resources. Yeah. Hey, thank thanks, you. guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Always Have fun. a great night. Good night. Happy Good night, Fourth everybody. Of July. <laughs> thank you. Hopefully Bye. it'll be cooler. Yes. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye-bye.